I thought I'd take a moment before we jump into the panel and just reflect on kind of some learnings from today. Uh, I just want to commend the three speakers. It was really an outstanding day. And I don't say that lightly because I've been to like only a thousand conferences. And I think the three of you just hit out of the park and some topics that, that really uh, don't get talked enough about, you know, the psychiatric piece of dementia care, sexuality. And then Elizabeth, I don't know how you do it, but you packed in such incredible information <clears throat> about research. And, and I have to say, um, on this World Alzheimer's Day actually helped me feel more hopeful about where we are, more optimistic about the future. So I'm very, very pleased. I, I guess, uh, Dr. Kales, a couple of things that I want to just comment about with your presentation is I, I was very fascinated by your word precision when it comes to dementia care. Because one thing I've been advocating for, for years about is that when you've met one person with dementia, you kind of met one person with dementia, that it's so important to individualize your approach and creativity and care. And I was delighted to you know, have you kind of be in that school because you know, I, I still hear people say, well, everybody with Alzheimer's is this way or everybody's that way. And to me, that kind of robs them of, of good care. Um, I'll just comment also that you know, I, I think your, um, your advocacy that hugs can be better than drugs, I think was terrific. <clears throat> and the DICE program is such a, I think such a contribution to our field of helping us you know, think through behaviors and, and approaches I love the fact that it seemed to encourage teamwork within a professional setting, which is so important. Uh, and, and you know, um, we can talk more about this during the discussion, but um, one of the things that I, I love having you, Dr. Kales, as a, as a new friend and colleague, but Elizabeth, Dan, and I go back at least 25 years, so we have a lot of history together. And <clears throat> I will say that sometimes I get chagrin because I think that in many ways, dementia care is actually fairly simple. If you you know, have uh, some well-trained team members, you have a good sensibility, you individualize care, you keep them active and busy, you keep them healthy, that's about half the battle, uh, caregiver support education, so, so well done. Um, I'll reflect really quickly on Dan and Elizabeth and then we'll open the floor. I think we're already getting a lot of good questions. Dan, again, uh, so good to be with you, my friend. We, we started way back together and have traveled many journeys. And, and you know, I'll be a little bit, um, kind of uh, poignant today, which is, you know, Dan, I, I kind of think, particularly you and I, I kind of hope we'd be out of business by now. Mm. I, I kind of hope we would have had an effective treatment, you know, or, or some better news, but maybe we'll get there. Maybe we'll get there because I think in so many ways, you know, we, we haven't, we have so much awareness. I think the battle against stigma has been won in so many ways, but we, we still have a long way to go. Uh, so in terms of your presentation, again, we'll come back to uh, the discussions, but um, you know, I, I, I laugh when you talked about your early discomfort. I think my first week at the University of Kentucky Alzheimer's Disease Research Center uh, on Aging, I was 28 years old, a brand new kind of social work slash family representative educator at the, at the then just one of 10 federally funded Alzheimer's Research Centers. And this 83-year-old lady came to my office and said, David, my husband wants sex, sex, sex all the time. What am I going to do? And I almost fainted. I was so, you know, so completely undone. And my longtime uh, writing partner, Virginia Bell, was in her 60s. She set me straight. So, you know, so I, I'm glad that uh, you did some good talking about that. There's some provocative questions coming in for you, Dan. And of course, Elizabeth, again, thank you for your leadership in, in dementia care, your work as a psychologist. Uh, Elizabeth is one of those people who, who I, I always want to say gets it, who really gets the fact that we have to keep taking good care of families and the person living with dementia and be an advocate uh, and, and at the same time, you know, move forward very boldly on research. So Elizabeth, thanks for your leadership. And I'll, I'll kind of now go to my friend, Trisha, and you're also going to get the first question, Trisha. Um, Trisha, you know, I, I've worked in this field for many, many years, and I've, I've come across many organizations and leaders. I just want to say thank you. you. You've had great vision and leadership. And I love the fact that in your world of assisted living, you see it as your mission, not just to do a good job internally, but to be really a leader and be so supportive of your colleagues in the industry. So thank you for that. Uh, and you get the first question, Trisha. <laughs> Hold your breath. Wow, what a six, seven months we've been through, a time of great loss and, and tragedy, but also a time of coming together. Um, how are you doing personally and professionally with this whole COVID crisis? And do you have any lessons learned or reflections about what we've 
what we've done so far? Anything that you reflected on as a leader trying to manage this medical model versus social model and keep, keep the good dementia programming going? Uh, obviously, assisted living and seniors in general has been a challenge during this COVID, you know, situation. And um, but I think it was especially difficult on our memory care floors. How do you convince people to wear a mask? How do you convince people to socially distance when you have dementia? And so, um, and and that that group, that population is especially fragile. And so obviously we disinfected our units. <clears throat> we tried to get residents and most residents after a lot of crowding will wear a mask in their common areas. Um, hand washing and sanitizing constantly. And we've built in some cohorts. So we tried to, to take the program and divide it into three different groups that kind of alternate from eating to resting in their apartments to activities. Um, the activities are very short in nature and it's appropriate for Alzheimer's and dementia anyway, um, and constantly rotating that. And then we've also identified individuals to be caregivers. And so this it applies in our communities and it applies at home. The caregiver is very important. I wouldn't hire a college student that goes out on the weekends to be the caregiver um, and, and not allowing those people and really um, isolating them from those dangers. And so we identified the people that were most compliant with being a caregiver and wearing their masks and most compliant and watching them and how they perform their care and what they do in their personal lives, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So it has been a challenge. It's not a perfect situation, um, uh, but knock on wood, we, we've successfully deterred from having COVID in any of at least our memory care programs. Trisha, do you think it is that we just have to do away with the social model and take care of the health model 100% with dementia care or, or can we have both? Uh, you can still have both. And I don't think that you can have a complete medical <laughs> model. I mean, if we went with a complete medical model, we'd strap them all down and not let them <laughs> fall or we would, you know, medicate them so they didn't do anything. And so that, that's just not appropriate. So activity um, should continue and you do your best to keep that social environment. Absolutely. And you know what happened is we, we had to make decisions. I mean, the, the advice is take all of your residents, put them in their room by themselves, lock the doors, you know, put the mm -hmm. meals under the door and, and that's it. But you can't do that. And so we had to be a little more flexible and balance what was appropriately mental for our residents, as well as the medical safeness of this. Now we don't allow visitors and those other things, but we still have programming every day. And quite frankly, most of our residents don't realize there's a pandemic going on. Mm -hmm. So they still wanna do bingo and socialize and, and, and eat with their roommates. So mm -hmm. those things have to still happen. <clears throat> well, very good. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that you know, we, we know that socialization in so many ways is the treatment for dementia. And so this has been a very tough time where opportunities for engagement and socialization have diminished, but good providers understand there's still a lot you can do to, to bring that affection and love and attention. So that's terrific. Let me just do a quick check-in with the panelists and maybe ask them, have they, are there any reflections uh, that they would like to share so far about how COVID has in, in influenced their work and the, the life of their patients and families. Uh, maybe Dr. Kales, you could kick us off if you've been in a reflective mood at all or thought about kind of where we are and where you think we're going. Uh, I think what Tricia just outlined, uh, do you guys hear me? I, I yes, don't know, yes. can you nod? Okay, um, I think what Tricia just outlined is exactly the balance we need to strike because if we do a complete medical model, um, I really worry about the risk to people in the long run emotionally about um, 
confinement, depression, anxiety, being left alone, those are real risks too, just as the virus is a risk. And I think the kind of balance that Tricia described is exactly what we need to do in our work and is so important to um, allowing people to have some, so we all need social contact, you know, we all feel this. And I think that what we are all feeling is what people with dementia are feeling as well. So I think what was described was really beautiful. Thank you, Dan, any reflections? Because I know <clears throat> Dan works in in in-home care. Um, any comments about that particular uh, realm? Well, when we uh, were all became we all became aware of how serious this was, uh, we went virtual uh, in our office. Uh, we had two different offices, and we were prepared uh, with a great web-based technology to connect all of our staff, and that's gone flawlessly. It's, it's really amazing. In fact, we're, we're talking about not even go going back into the office for at least six more months. It's going so well. Uh, mm -hmm. However, where it really affected our caregivers, so we employ about 250, 260 caregivers who are out in the field every day, and uh, we pride ourselves on high touch uh, with them. Uh, and so we have not been able to conduct the in-person training which was real a dif differentiator for yeah. our agency because we focus it on dementia like no other in the state of Illinois. And that's saying a lot given there's 800 plus home care agencies. So we, we've been scrambling to try to replicate, uh, but there's, there's no substitute because mm -hmm. uh, the classes that I structured were highly interactive. I engaged the caregivers in teaching each other. I would just sort of tee it up for them. So trying to have that level of interaction online it's been a real challenge for me as an educator. And I think because we have not been able to replicate the in-person, it, it has affected, I think, uh, the quality of our work. So we are working overtime to try to do better on that front. Mm -hmm. uh, most especially though, David, I would say uh, families are the main, uh, our main customers. We do a lot of work in uh, independent living, helping to supplement existing staff, but, uh, that's where we see the most pain because of the uh, isolation, the lack of uh, respite, the inability to get out and enjoy memory cafes, to take advantage of adult day centers, uh, the general reluctance to even consider going into residential care because of all the COVID related deaths. So we've been doing a lot of uh, outreach to the families who have been really struggling with their own uh, isolation and I think it's intensified their depression. Uh, family dynamics, as you know, are, can get really crazy. And, and any one of us during a stressful time is more prone to be upset. And we're seeing that played out with our family. So right. we're putting a lot of uh, time and attention mm -hmm. in that direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dan. Elizabeth, we talked a bit about this uh, during before the last uh, break. Uh, any other thoughts that have come to your mind about kind of maybe visioning the, the post-COVID world and what you'd like to see come out of this, if there can be any good out of it. Oh, isn't that a wonderful thought? Post-COVID world. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that day. You know, uh, one thing I was thinking, David, um, that I didn't mention before that, um, it, it, I guess it shouldn't have surprised me, but, but I was a bit surprised at how we had to activate. This was more in, in California. Um, I don't think it you had the same issue in Hawaii, but what we started to seeing uh, see across the country was states coming out with recommendations around rationing of care. So um, mm. in the state of California, they put forth guidelines that said, well, here's who should and here's who shouldn't get, who, who should be last in line for a ventilator. And guess what the number one guess what the leading diagnosis was that they put up there? You, you can all guess, um, it was Alzheimer's and dementia um, without really specifying anything related to quality of life, just kind of equating mm -hmm. that with a value. And um, I'm really glad that we serve on the government's task, on the governor's task force um, in two different major task forces and we're able to raise this up and say, is that really what we want to be saying? 
that a diagnosis equates with value either positively or negatively. And um, we were successful in having that removed uh, from the criteria um, that it's really more quality of life, not a given diagnosis. And they, they actually pulled back on the whole thing and thankfully it didn't end up being an issue. But it's, it's times like this where you think, Wow, so this is why we do this. <laughs> this That's is right. why we need to be, as I said before, shouting from the mountaintops um, to represent these families and these individuals who we all care deeply about and who are too often forgotten. So it was eye-opening to me. I, I guess it, it maybe shouldn't have been, but um, it really, you see that slippery slope and it happens really quickly in a pandemic. Um, I also want to thank uh, Trisha and and all of all of the staff who have been caring for our loved ones in long term care settings, especially residential settings, for truly being heroes um, for the families you serve. Um, I, I'm sure they've been saying this to you and how grateful they are. But um, it's it means the world to know that if you can't be there, that there's someone who who acts like, you know, who loves your, your mom <laughs> and your dad. And, and I know that was what it was like for me with the folks who cared for my mom. So I just want to thank you all, all of you who do this work um, with these families, um, because you, you really have been angels during this, this thank awful Thank you so much, time. Elizabeth. Okay, well, let's jump in. And now we're like almost in a game show format. Can we stump the experts or throw some <laughs> interesting questions out? And please do type your questions in. And again, Dr. Kales, uh, you know, um, so nice to have you here uh, representing this, you know, incredible profession of geropsychiatry. Uh, and we already, and, and so, hey, everybody on the call, this is your chance to ask the doctors So type in your questions. So let me jump in. Um, a family member writes that she doesn't think that her mom needs to be on all these psych meds, but the building the mom is at says, no, no, she needs to be on these psych meds for management. Um, in general, Dr. Kales, how would you suggest that a family kind of advocate for medication reviews or advocate to get mom and dad off some of these psychotropic meds? I think that's a great question. And in my experience as a physician, um, the squeaky wheel tends to get the grease. And I think uh, just advocating and asking for a review in and of itself is very important. And I would actually ask if you could meet with the physician to talk or pharmacist to talk about the various medication combinations, why they're being prescribed, exactly what they're being prescribed for, um, how long the person is expected to be on those medications, and what non-pharmacologic strategies have been tried? I think those are very good things to ask. And in fact, um, one of the things we suggest with the DICE approach is that people take in those uh, non-pharmacologic scripts to talk to their physician about and ask, could these things be tried um, to really understand uh, exactly what's going on in that particular facility. There may be good reasons for those medications, um, that's not to say the person shouldn't be on them, but I feel like a caregiver has the right to know exactly why every medication is being prescribed. And could there be some reduction in those? Is that possible? I think it's entirely um, within the purview of a family member to ask those questions. Great. And um, my understanding, Dr. Kales, of your, your theme this today was that you know, hugs are better than drugs, but we're not going to say that they're never necessary. But yeah. you know, again, take this broader approach, look for environmental solutions, behavioral solutions. Maybe you have a family member living at home who has delusions and paranoia and the house is dark and cluttered. Improve the lighting, open the curtains, and, and that some of these things might mean that we don't need to go the psych drug, psych, psychotropic drug route. Well, exactly, and, and kind of like in the example I gave with Gemma, um, staff didn't really have the information that they needed to create those non-pharmacological solutions that, you know, she liked certain types of music, that she didn't like the kind of activities that the facility had, that those weren't really her cup of tea, and that doing these alternative things that had worked at home um, could actually be very helpful. So I think interface between the family and the staff in terms of what the person's interests are, what they have been and what they are currently 
And what kind of things have worked in the past is really, really useful information. Terrific. A couple more questions and then I'll put Dan on the hot seat next. Uh, uh, could you talk a bit about neuropsychological evaluations, you know, where we see on television or in documentaries where you ask someone to count backwards by seven or draw a clock face? Um, how important is it for someone to have that kind of neuropsychological exam as part of a workup or evaluation? So Elizabeth can probably answer this as well, being a psychologist. Um, I view those as absolutely critical part of a diagnostic process. One of the things that I have a hard time with is when I see somebody placed on a cognitive enhancer or medication without any type of workup. I think that um, memory loss in itself is kind of like agitation. Um, we don't know that it's dementia until we actually do a workup um, because it could be due to many causes. There could be depression, there could be a thyroid problem, uh, there could be a delirium or a medication effect. And so one of the things that neuropsychological testing does is it really helps us to discern what type of memory problem is going on and what possible parts of the brain are involved. Neuropsychological testing is very precise in actuality and can really help us understand if this is a vascular type dementia or an Alzheimer's type dementia or a frontotemporal type dementia, in which case the prognosis may be very different. So I view that as very critical. Elizabeth, do you want to comment about that, uh, the testing at all? No, I, I agree uh, with Dr. Kales. I think it really does add, and it's actually really helpful for the family to, for the individual themselves to see what are your strengths and where are you, where are you struggling? Because um, I think often we think of Alzheimer's or any of the other types of dementia as having the same symptoms, you know, we're, we're not always that good at differentiating what, what is the difference between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body dementia and having that uh, more detailed information lets you know if you're trying to work with this individual and help them, uh, this strategy might be more helpful than that strategy. You know, knowing more about their strengths and weaknesses is, is very, very helpful. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I know from my own experience. One more thing, David. Oh, please, please. Oh, sorry. Um, so what the person described in their question is actually a screen. So they're probably describing either a, a mini mental status exam or a MOCA. And that's the kind of screening that people would often do at the bedside or um, in an office visit. Neuropsychological testing is more detailed. Um, I would say that the four hour type of neuropsych testing that we used to do probably isn't what we want to put a family and person with dementia mm. through. <clears throat> but hour testing where we look at things like mm. Elizabeth described like executive function and other types of functions so that we can pinpoint strengths and weaknesses is actually very, very useful. And, and, you know, one thing I've found is that sometimes if you have five or six siblings and there's a lot of denial and conflict about whether mom is having problems or not, that that neuropsych eval, that letter can actually um, often kind of help the family overcome denial. You know, if, if the psychologist says your mother thinks President Eisenhower is doing a great job and she's 40, not 80, that can probably be helpful for the family. Uh, Liz, uh, one more one, sorry, one more question for you, Dr. Kales. I love this question. When should, when should someone go to a geriatric psychiatrist versus a neurologist? That is a great question. And clearly there's a lot of overlap um, between our fields. When I was at University of Michigan, I worked in a geriatric center where we had geriatric medicine folks, neurologists, and us. And there clearly was a lot of overlap between what all of us did. I think a geriatric psychiatrist clearly can diagnose uh, dementia. Um, however, I would say that the, the most use is when there is sort of a mix between uh, behavioral issues or depression and memory. And so one of the most common um, things that we would see in geriatric psychiatry is someone coming to us and having the uh, caregiver or other people say, is this a memory disorder or a mood disorder? And we would sort of have to figure out what's going on. So I'd say when there's a mix of psychiatric symptoms and cognitive symptoms, that's probably the best referral to a geriatric psychiatrist. 
That's very good to say. And of course, sometimes family, I guess sometimes these, these mental health diagnoses have never been diagnosed properly or that no one really knows. So that'd be very helpful. Uh, one late breaking question for you, Dr. Kales, do you recommend a certain um, instrument or tool for the testing? Is one better than the other or is it situational? So uh, generally what I would use in the office is the MOCA. And the reason that I would use a MOCA, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment is because it tends to be more uh, sensitive early on. Um, so when we're seeing things like uh, executive impairment, the mini mental status exam uh, doesn't pick those up necessarily. Um, however, one thing I would mention is that as dementia progresses and somebody is a little later in stage, um, there are sort of effects where the MOCA is no longer usual, uh, useful and I would track dementia with the mini mental status exam. If I see something that looks suspicious on the MOCA, then I would refer the person to one of my colleagues in neuropsychology. These are people who are specialized in looking at uh, how somebody scores on different tests, you know, um, tests of, as I said, um, you know, one might be the trail making test and other types of tests that people would look at for executive impairment and other types of memory issues. And they also take into account what somebody's pre-morbid functioning is. That's very, very important. So if somebody, uh, you know, didn't graduate from school and, and has a hard time reading, we're gonna look at those testing results a little differently. And similarly, um, when I was at Michigan, I often saw college professors and What's interesting about that group, and in Michigan, I think we had the highest per capita um, PhDs in the country. Um, one interesting thing about that is that it's harder to pick up dementia in those people because they have relatively high cognitive reserves. So on something like a mini mental status, they'll score 30 when they actually have uh, some mild dementia. So that's where we need our neuropsychology colleagues to weigh in. Very good, very good, thank you. Uh, Dan, again, thank you for a terrific presentation. Can you talk a bit more about the assisted living world where, you know, you have maybe a couple of residents who are showing affection toward each other. Let's just say for the sake of argument, they both have partners or spouses. Um, what are some early things the staff should think about in terms of family education? And part two is what if the family, let's say one of the spouses just is not down with this whatsoever and is having meltdowns and you know demanding that the staff you know don't let my mother hold his hand any just general reflections of that, that continuum of what you'd advise the staff if you were if you were consulting or what would be some of your steps i i think transferring anybody from home into any kind of residential care setting is is probably the most dramatic event in the life of a family and certainly in the life of a spouse they're literally entrusting the care of a loved one into the hands of strangers. And until staff prove that they are worthy of that trust, families are suspicious and rightfully so. And so from day one, families need to be engaged with the staff. Families need to know that they had their loved one in the safest possible place under the care of people with big hearts and who know what they're doing. And so early on, staff need to prove themselves. And there should be a designated person, more than just the marketing person who brought them in, but some of the direct care staff, meaning CNAs and other caregivers who are doing the actual work. And David, that's why I've always thought so highly of your work, because you really turned me on to this whole notion of the life story. And so asking for that life story, what is the history? Uh, this can shed light on who this person was in the past and who this person is now, and it may explain their behaviors. So to engage families at that level prior to admission is so important to start that conversation, to build up that very uh, strong bond between staff and families, because the families are really at the mercy of the staff. Mm -hmm. And there's so much disappointment if, if, if staff are not sharing details about who's touching whom and who's hanging out with whom and and where so i think certainly initially there, there should be a full court press to use the basketball analogy to engage them as much as possible and to make sure there are no secrets and from the very beginning to let them know you know we, we see your loved one striking up friendships 
And uh, she seems very popular with this one gentleman. And they've taken a liking to each other. And it, it's, it's very sweet. They, they seem to enjoy each other, not to sexualize that, not, not to act as if, well, you know, this is uh, a fire about to break out. No, to, to normalize this, because most families don't have a clue about what goes on inside of care facilities. They, they're lost. This is a foreign culture. So we, we need to, to bridge the gap between their ignorance about what goes on and what we know on an everyday basis from our perspective as staff. So if someone is beginning a, a friendship that turns into a special friendship and maybe even a romance, it doesn't come with a shock. It's right. a gradual uncovering of this is the new reality and we support them in this new normal. So that families are not shocked by what's going on. Now, some people, on the other hand, getting to your second question, will be shocked no matter what, because they had they had dissension with the family about this decision in the first place. There may be a great deal of guilt. Uh, the financial obligation is enormous, and they are just still rattled by this all-important decision. And so they're looking for reasons to hate you as staff. They're looking for a reason to reverse this decision. Mm -hmm. They're looking for a reason to blame this dementia on somebody else and staff make easy targets. And so we gotta be careful. And in these really tough situations, I hope staff appoint someone. <laughs> you know, most assisted living facilities don't have a social worker on staff, but somebody must be well experienced and have good communication skills to try to pacify these folks and get them over this hump until they're feeling connected to the staff and they're working through those difficult feelings and putting them in touch with other family members within the community who are well adjusted, who have been through this hard time mm -hmm. together. And if that's not possible, to, to direct them to a nearby support group uh, online or in person whenever that they may return. So to, to make Great. these very strong bonds may mitigate some of those problems that many people go through. Well, Dan, I really like you know the elements of your answer about you know take to being proactive, being serious, but also what I hear you saying in some ways is educate the family. You know, you it, it's I'm I'm being very concise right now. I want to do it this quickly with the family. You know, this idea that you know your your husband may not remember that. He was married. He may be, and may he may mistake this other woman for his wife. There's so many different elements, and and certainly I've seen some families travel a pretty painful journey, but really end up in a place where they say, you know, my dad's happy. I think <clears throat> that if he's happy, that's okay. You know, any of the other panelists want to weigh in on this subject before I hit uh, Dan with another question? Um, I just wanted to weigh in on one thing Dan said that I thought was so beautiful, which was talking about the life story. Um, and that's, I think, something critical that family members can do when somebody comes into a facility. And this also touches on what Elizabeth said um, about, you know, the state of California. And I really think one of the issues we're dealing with here is stigma. And sadly, in a way, it's almost like we have to prove people's worth to say, hey, this is somebody here. And this is somebody worth paying attention to and a human being who has a long history of being loved by other people. I mean, again, it's sad that we have to do it, but I think it's really important. And I go back to when I was an intern uh, and somebody came in and, you know, when you're an intern, you kind of view all the patients as a uh, you know, sadly, train wrecks that, you know, come in and you have to take care of all their medical problems. And our senior resident said, this gentleman who has dementia and is somewhat delirious was a federal judge. And he's somebody that, you know, had a long history of, and it really changed our perspective taking care of him to say, you know, right now he has delirium and he's not making sense. But this is somebody that merits our <clears throat> passion, love, care, and attention. And I think that's what we need to communicate to people so that, again, it's sad we have to do it, but it's so important. And, and of course, just to be able to call him judge by his proper name and knowing that is a huge thing because yes, you know, that absolutely. he may or may not fully remember having been a judge, but it touches that memory and 
helps him feel like you know him and he knows you. And when that gentleman had the cognitive clearing, you know, to get back to his baseline, it taught us all a lesson, you know, that, that this person um, was temporarily in this state and, you know, he had some cognitive impairment at baseline, but our treatment made a difference. And therefore, it's really important that we have to do it. Dr. Kales, can I trouble you for a quick definition? What is the difference between delirium and dementia? Oh, that's such a good question. So dementia, as um, many people may know, is an umbrella term for uh, cognitive impairment plus other symptoms like executive problems and um, there may be problems with speech, either understanding speech or delivering speech. Um, and that's something that is insidious. It tends to develop over time. There are some places where dementia can develop suddenly, such as vascular dementia, where somebody has like a massive stroke and has cognitive problems after that. But in most cases, dementia as an Alzheimer's disease is something that develops over time and slowly progresses. A delirium is an acute confusional state and anybody can develop that. I was just, uh, as I said, I had surgery two weeks ago and had the privilege of being in the PACU for eight hours. And I heard a lot of delirious people around me. And so something like having anesthesia can provoke mm -hmm. a delirium. And age is probably the biggest risk factor for delirium. So as people age, they are more prone to developing a delirium. That doesn't necessarily mean they're prone to developing dementia. It just means they have less reserve. So they may be on certain kinds of medications or have certain medical disorders that cause them to develop that acute confusional state. And what we need to realize is that state is reversible. Too often, I see people who go into the hospital, are older, develop a delirium, and somebody diagnoses a dementia while they're in the hospital without any neuropsychological testing or any evidence that this is a chronic thing. And that has a lot of consequences. And so that's something that as a geriatric psychiatrist, I'm a huge advocate for really pushing back against those diagnoses that are made when somebody is cross-sectionally in a hospital because all bets are off. You're on all kinds of medications. I mean, I had to take a number of medications when I, I probably was a little confused. God help me if I was diagnosed with dementia, but if you're older, that can happen. So this is a really, really important distinction. And if you do find your older uh, loved one diagnosed with dementia while in the hospital, I would push back on that and ask for neuropsychological testing when they are clearer and out of the hospital to make sure that that is what you're actually dealing with. So that's a Terrific. great question. Elizabeth, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I loved I loved what you said, Dr. Kales, and what a uh, what a great question. I wanted to share something that I learned at a conference that we held at Stanford, and this was the topic because I agree with you, um, Helen, that this is something that we see all the time. People either the delirium's being missed or they're being diagnosed with dementia, and we had an expert um, who came in and presented on delirium, and he said he decided to place a bet with his colleagues at Stanford um, in the ICU and he said, I bet that 90% of the cardiac ICU unit of people over X age are going to have a delirium. It was something like 90% of these patients will have a delirium if I look. <clears throat> and he said, I lost the bet because 100% of the cardiac unit ICU of cognitively normal individuals met the criteria for delirium. And it was such a compelling presentation that it really made me think about my own uh, future as you know, a, a patient and wanting to make sure my family knows what delirium looks like, but also as a professional to, to realize if, if it's anyone who's older, and older could be in your 70s, um, it doesn't need to be in your 90s, that really, um, an insult, a medical insult can lead to something that looks very different than when you're in your 50s or your 40s. So that was, uh, I just thought it was so great. And I wish everybody knew this um, because we don't, and we're trying to be advocates for our family members. Very important, very important. Okay, another question for Dan. Uh, this one's a very good question for Dan. Have you seen cases where, where someone who was heterosexual in their life before dementia 
is now attracted to the same sex during later stages or vice versa. Someone who is LGBTQ start to become more attracted to the opposite sex in later stages. Oh, wow. Well, yes, 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 yes. Um, it's unusual, but, um, you know, we, we tend to think in this, uh, we tend to think about sexuality in terms of gay, straight, male, female, you know, the more we learn about sexuality, you know, we're all at a spectrum. Uh, we know there are many closeted people, especially older people. Um, they married, they had children, and um, they were deemed a straight, at least in the eyes of the world. Uh, maybe not always in the eyes of their family who knew them best, but now in the course of dementia, losing their inhibitions, mm -hmm they become their, the essence of their true self. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it's so important to get that history again, to know what they were all about. And so um, also, I, I've also noticed there are some people who misidentify other genders, okay? Um, men, men thinking that women are men, women thinking that women are men. And so that is just part of dementia facial recognition, uh, there are subtle clues about gender identity that maybe are confusing to people with dementia. And so this may cause an attraction too. So it's always a matter of trying to see life through their eyes and to know their history as well as possible. Now that presents some special problems for the families who are seeing this. And again, we, we need to always be in contact with them about what we're observing and try to interpret as best we can the meaning behind these behaviors. Because to label these behaviors pathological or antisocial or uh, aberrant doesn't do them justice. Because that's when we start to see that people are being suppressed. And, and we, we need to, to take precautions against these kinds of quick judgments. Well, Dan, as always, what a, what a, what a great a answer to the question. And, and, you know, again, even lends itself to some of Dr. Kale's work with DICE and, you know, the Alzheimer's Association work about education and learning, you know, that it can be an aspect of the disease or it could be an aspect of life story. My own mother who passed away in 2008 with Alzheimer's, she was sometimes when we were sitting in memory care, she would, she would say, now that person over there, is that a man or a woman? She had a lot of facial recognition issues. And, and when you think about it, a lot of even our staff may not wear a lot of makeup or may have short hair. So it's not like, you know, I think my mother would have recognized someone with a bouffant hairdo and lipstick and earrings because it would have been those cues and clues about it. Uh, let me, before we run out of time, just run through a few more questions that have come in to see if we get them answered. Elizabeth, uh, someone asked if you could just explain again why De delaying the average onset of Alzheimer's five years, why seemingly about half the cases would, would disappear. I, I think yeah. I know the answer. You might know the that. answer, yeah. Um, uh, it, I, I guess would... it's a little bit of a dark answer. It's because he <laughs> died from something else. So it's, but if, if we think about, you know, think about ourselves, I think many of us would hope to, you know, live a long life and die in our sleep having, you know, left all the people we love in good shape, right? Um, and saying goodbyes. Um, what the uh, research suggests is that if we could just postpone uh, the onset of the symptoms that people would pass away from other causes, whether that's cardiovascular disease or cancer or other major issues, it would mean that fewer people would die uh, with Alzheimer's and in particular, dementia related to Alzheimer's. So, you know, there was one thing, David, that I didn't mention before, and it's, it's kind of this, um, this notion that I could envision us being at the point where if we could make it so that the symptoms of dementia don't happen, where we have Alzheimer's, but it doesn't cause dementia, wouldn't that be a wonderful option right. um, to have? And that's really um, definitely one of the things that they're looking for. So in this scenario that I, that <clears throat> I shared with you all, that's actually kind of related to that. So um, Alzheimer's is cooking along for decades before it produces dementia. And if we could just have it cook for five more years, 
the evidence suggests that that would mean that half of all people would not end up having those symptoms of dementia. Super. Let me uh, ask a simple question and maybe each panelist could just share one or two thoughts, but how do you help a frustrated caregiver? Dan, do you want to kick us off on this one with your social work background? Well, I, I think we want, we want to first of all listen. What is the source of frustration? There may be multiple sources, okay? And so we need to have that conversation, not treat the frustration as a symptom, get to the underlying causes, and there may be multiple things. Maybe there was never a good relationship mm -hmm. prior to the onset of dementia. Maybe there is a deep-seated history here that we need to delve into that makes caregiving next to impossible. Uh, we need to really uh, understand the depth of the grief that's involved, and grief involves anger, frustration, denial, of course, depression, perhaps, and so to really get to the underlying feelings uh, that account for this frustration. All the time, uh, I'm sure, uh, Trisha, in your work at, at Plaza, working with hundreds of family members and my own work in home care, again, hundreds of family members, there's always a, a number, a minority, that are ex exasperated for one reason or another. These are people who would never be pleased with anything. And it turns out they usually have got all kinds of pre-existing problems. And whatever we do can't please them. And so we, we need to figure out what we can and cannot do for these individuals. We've actually been in a position of terminating clients because of family members. We, we did our best. We listened. We worked for weeks and weeks mm -hmm. and weeks. And it's, it's a very tough decision but we give them ample opportunity to, to work with us and still no progress. But in the vast majority of cases, we listen to them, we connect with them, and we get over whatever hump they're experiencing until the next time. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Tricia, any reflections from all your work with families over the years about how you deal with someone who just seems to be so frustrated? You know, um... We see our residents as they are pre they're presented, and usually they've already been diagnosed and present all these problems, and um, and we just deal with that. And family members see that person as their mother or their grandmother, and all the other things that led up to that person arriving there. So they have set in certain expectations. Uh, of that person and it's obviously easier for us as caregivers in, in of the disease to deal with them. We are also people that get breaks and only do that for eight hours a day. Um, and as a family caregiver, you can't take care of somebody 24 seven. So you have to schedule breaks or moments that you can have to yourself and take care of yourself. Amen. And, uh, you know, this is so cliche, but you have to get educated about the disease and have an understanding of how to speak slowly and calmly and how to deal with behaviors and how to de-escalate. Um, it, it's funny, I, over and over again, you just see these families making the same mistakes and that lead to the same behaviors. And so you have to teach and educate them on how to be caregivers. Um, and it's so emotionally charged, it, it, it's difficult. So it's much harder to be a family caregiver than a professional caregiver. Um, and I think that it's the det detachment of the emotion to a certain degree or the connection, and it's also getting a break and it's the education. Thank you, Dr. Kales, anything else to add? Yeah, so I would answer this in two parts. I think Dan answered the first part beautifully, but I just want to add to that. So what is the frustration coming from? Is it sort of a material thing where uh, they don't have the resources to care for the person or there isn't enough social support and they need some type of respite? Is it something psychologically that they're depressed and uh, you know they themselves need treatment? That's something really important to, to figure out. We also have to remember uh, in kind of what Trisha was saying, our family caregivers often may not have that education. They may have been given a diagnosis and nobody ever told them, for example, that hallucinations might be part of this illness. 
And so, you know, that's really scary when that happens because they're thinking Alzheimer's is a memory disorder and all of a sudden mom is hallucinating or paranoid. And where is that coming from? And so that education is so important. The second part that I want to underscore is in talking about individualization, we need to think of our caregivers as individuals as well. They are not a, heter a homogeneous population. Similar to parenting styles, caregivers have styles that are, are different, and we're actually studying that, as I mentioned. And so we have people at one end of the continuum who they're very, um, you know, they're not ready for education. They're externalizing and they're kind of angry. And so what they need is very different than somebody who's sort of a natural caregiver who's very empathic. And, you know, what they need is not to burn out. And so along that continuum, caregivers have different needs depending on who they are. And we shouldn't think of our interventions for them as sort of one size fits all. Terrific. Well, this may be a good question to wrap up this terrific day with. A question came in and, you know, what are, what are some elements of a quality dementia care program, whether you're assisted living, skilled nursing, in-home, day center? Um, Elizabeth, uh, do you want to kick us off? What, what, do you, what would you look for for yeah. yourself, your own family? What are just a few yeah. elements? Well, and you know, having you gone think? through this myself, I, I got to, to live it. Uh, and, and you heard all the travails, David, <laughs> as I was going through it. So it was really fascinating you know, to work in this profession for 25 years, but it was about five years ago that I was uh, choosing homes for my mother um, or services for my mom. And I, it, it did match up with what I'd been telling people in that, you know, the, the surroundings in a, in a long-term care setting are not the best measure of the quality of care. So, um, and we did end up having my mom in a place that looked really nice. And, um, and yet I, I didn't feel the kindness um just the warmth and the kindness that that the the mm -hmm. team that we were working with really were in it to just partner and make sure that my mom could live the best quality life and that's i, I guess that's a hard thing to measure isn't it but sometimes when you when you find the right place that you you also feel it in your bones it's like mm -hmm. okay you know um this isn't the, the nicest looking place, but the people seem to genuinely care. And it's that person-centered care. Of course, I do look at other things like what kinds of activities, how happy are the residents? What is the food like? You know, are people smiling? Um, what, are, what are the reactions that you get when you visit? But it's so hard to tell. And just going in and visiting, mm -hmm. I mean, really so <clears throat> much of it is word of mouth, but mm -hmm. your situation and what works for your loved one it, it, it is not a one size fits all. So what worked for my mom would be different from what it would have been for your mom. And I think that's what's so hard. And it reminds me of that last question for the caregiver feeling frustrated or, you know, what to do is that um, you do the best you can with all mm -hmm. of this. And there are no one right answer. There is not one best right answer for most of the questions. And that is so hard to live with, I think. You just want to know, tell me which one I should go to, <laughs> right? So how, how many people ask us that every day? Years ago, a friend of mine said, how come, how come I can choose a restaurant and read 100 reviews online, but I can't choose a nursing home and read 100 reviews? Well, of course, now you can to some extent. Yeah. Dan, if I can ask you, since you work in the in-home setting, I mean, feel free to share any broad qualities you look for in dementia care, but maybe just share an idea or two if I'm considering in-home care, what to look for. Well, I think in-home in care, we, we try to differentiate ourselves by making sure that our caregivers are well-equipped with proper training and education. But it can't just be that. They, our caregivers know that they are valued. Uh, we pay them well, we have benefits for them. They are loved by everybody in our agency. Um, I've never met an owner like our very own whose head is on the right, his head is in the right place. Uh, 
he's financially successful, but I, I attribute that to the fact that he loves everybody in our agency. And that permeates everything we do. Teamwork is essential. He listens to everybody, no matter how outside the thinking is. Ultimately, the buck stops with him, but he is a collaborator. He's not an authoritarian leader. He builds consensus, he makes decisions, and he puts a high value on, on loving everybody in our midst. And I know that sounds soft and maybe hokey, but I think that's the driving force of any successful organization. Well, thank, thank you, Dan. We've talked a lot about culture change. That's something very, very important. And uh, I also, though, do want to pick up that you said some very specific things about, you know, does your agency pay benefits? And, you know, what kind of training do people get? And I think it's fair to ask those questions. Uh, Tricia, our time is getting very short here, but one or two words, you, if, if, if you were on an airplane and some, I guess, I guess maybe we're not on airplanes anymore. <laughs> Next year, when you're on an airplane and someone says to you, well, I need to choose a place in Omaha for my mom, what should I look for? What would be just a few quick words you'd share with them? Um, well, I, I think you have to go, a lot of it is what Elizabeth said. Uh, it, it's a feeling that you have, you really have to look at the outcomes. Um, is my mom happy? Does she feel good? Is she in a good mood? You know, those type of things. Um, and I guess when you're in the process of picking it, it would be spending time on the unit and seeing that if you see that uh, amongst the other residents. Um, I think the most popular comment we get from our staff is how friendly they are. And I think that's why most of our units are so uh, popular is it's just the relationship between the caregivers, our friends, we call them friends because we follow the best friend approach, but the friendship that occurs between the caregiver and the resident uh, is a really important relationship. I mean, they spend more time than you will, you know, in your weekly visits or your phone calls. And so um, I'd be very observant of that. Well, thank you, Tricia. And certainly, um, I've observed great friendships uh, at the plaza. So thank you for that. Uh, I do think people with dementia actually, in many ways, are even more sensitive to the mood of the room, to the energy, to the emotion, as cognition and language uh, fade away. Uh, Dr. Kales, we're almost out of time, but you know, let's say you're looking for a place for your Aunt Sophie. Uh, what are two or three things that you would look for, even maybe through the medical lens? Sure. I think what Elizabeth outlined about person-centered care is very important. And sadly, that's very hard to define. Um, it's something you can feel more than see. Um, and I think about a study we did in three assisted living facilities, and two of them were probably the most beautiful things I've ever seen with fireplaces and waterfalls and food that had, you know, all kinds of um, towers and things like that. The place I put my mom was the third place that um, was just, it felt family oriented, it felt like a family. Um, so one of the things I would actually ask about is staff turnover. I think that that is really important um, because if somebody has an organization like Dan outlined, the turnover is going to be lower than a place where people are treated as commodities. The last thing I think is really important is look before there's an emergency. So the worst time to look for a nursing home is when somebody has been put in the hospital and there's some type of medical emergency. If, if you know, I as a physician see it heading toward a nursing home, I urge my caregivers to start looking because it's better to look when the pressure is off than when it's on. Well said, and that's so important because Alzheimer's and these other dementias, as my mother's neurologist, Dr. Harbaugh, said to me once, it's kind of like a slow and lazy river. So you do have time in most cases to plan ahead and you don't want to make those decisions in emergencies. I'll just leave us with one, uh, one or two final thoughts and then uh, ask Ray uh, to, to close the session. Um, you know, I often, when I do staff training, talk about uh, Maya Angelou's famous quote that I'll paraphrase, that people will never remember what you said or did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. Now, she did not write that quote about dementia care, but I think it's a very, very powerful sentiment for dementia care that the emotional communication, friendship, particularly now during COVID, 
you know, letting someone know they're, they're loved, that they have a friend, that you're there for them, smiles, uh, warmth, affection, really does build self-esteem. I think create a caring culture and reduce dementia-related behaviors. That along with activities and engagement are very important. And a final just sort of appreciation and blessing, one of the heroes in our field was a gentleman named Dr. Tom Kitwood, who did a lot of early, early research on caregiving. And he said, caregivers are physicians of the human spirit. So I wanna thank you all for being physicians of the human spirit and being with us in this terrific day. And I. I'm very sad we couldn't all be in Hawaii together, but next year, 